Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, I don't know how long this is going to go. Uh, I think it was time for me to just speak what the Lord put in my heart, I believe, to share with people that I think will bring comfort, maybe a little bit of uncomfortableness. I don't know either way, but um, I'm willing to share it because I think it would be helpful, hopefully, to bring some peace. And um, right now in the world we live in, the times we live in, I think it's incredibly important that we're we're peacemaking, you know, restoring people. Um, I shared some time with Brother Will this morning, and it was truly a blessing. Being together with like my believers is a, a big deal. So if you don't have that, you know, maybe this is the way we're 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 getting it is through Instagram or some other social media. But try to I would say try to limit as much as you can the amount of time you spend on social media because it can be a, a massive <laughs> It could be a massive distraction to what God's really trying to show you in your life. Now, you can glean things from people on Instagram or, you know, YouTube or whatever it might be. But right now we're living in a very confusing time um, and we're in a, in a world that's confusing. So I say the world is Babylon. Um, yes, peace is the Ten Commandments for sure, brother. And it's, you know, it's an exciting time, I think, to be uh, a believer today uh, because it's, you're, the world's not going to make sense anymore, and I think that's the blessing of of the end times is that is that God's showing His His remnant, His true believers, that we don't belong to this world. Um, so I wanted to share a few things with you just from the scriptures that I hope will connect. Um, it's sort of a little bit of a Bible study, so if you're into Bible study, then you know this will be for you. If you don't like Bible study because it's sort of uncomfortable and it's sort of like maybe you know tune in another time, I guess. Um, I, I don't believe in giving motivational speeches. You can find those, you know, every Sunday in most churches, they're going to give you some sort of like uh, rah-rah, you know, message that makes you feel, you know, happy that you leave there feeling like, yeah, I feel good. You know, I, I believe in Jesus, that sort of thing. Well, that's not going to work, especially if you know the word of God and you start seeing that persecution is actually promised to the believers. You know, if you read Second Timothy, it says that every believer will be persecuted for their faith. Um, I think that I, we've lived in a time where we think that that's not something that's going to happen to you because we had such prosperity. Um, and I think if you're coming to a place where you're a little freaked out, I think that's good because you're going to start seeing that maybe all this prosperity and now what's happening in, in our nation, you know, getting back to the root in the in the scriptures is going to show you that uh, God is not happy with the behavior of the church, okay? He's actually very angry with the church. And I would say the world is the world, and the wickedness in the world, you know, that, that that's going to happen. But we were called to be set-apart people in the world, not of the world. So here we are in 2021 on the Gregorian calendar, 2,000 years post-execution, burial, resurrection of our Messiah, who many people were celebrating today. Um, and what I'll tell you is a few things. I want to show you some of the verses maybe they shared with you today in the, in the churches. But I want to read from 1 Corinthians 15. You know, it's all about the resurrection. And I saw a lot of posts about it. In fact, I posted about it as well. Um, but actually, I think there's like, there might be like, 30 to 40 actual references in 1 Corinthians 15 to the Old Testament scriptures. That should make you pause and like hit the pause button and say, what do you mean there's like 30 or 40 references in one chapter in the Bible? In fact, you'll see prophet, prophet Isaiah quoted many times, many of the Psalms. You'll see Hosea, prophet Hosea, Daniel. You'll see Ezekiel and uh, the book of Genesis are actually quoted in 1 Corinthians 15. So 1 Corinthians 15 is, you know, it's about the, the Messiah. Like it's a huge, a very powerful, very, very powerful um, passage in, in the scriptures, in the, in, in the New Testament. Um, I'm going to read a few verses from it. And I'm going to point out a couple words that you may or may not have seen before. But if you haven't, then hallelujah. And maybe this will cause you to search the scriptures, okay? Uh, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search it out. So if your heart is is searching, then that's a good thing. But don't let the enemy stop you, right? And the enemy within you is your flesh, stop you from pursuing what God is calling you to pursue, which is his, his holiness, his righteousness, 
and to, to his presence. So 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20, then I'll read through part of 23. It says, But now Messiah Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. I said first fruits because that's a key word. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also has come through a man, Yeshua, the Messiah, right? And then he continues in verse 22. As for an Adam, all die. Also in the Messiah will be made alive. So the connection here is, is that one man caused sin to enter into the world. And people say, well, it was Eve's sin. Adam was there, okay? That's very clear in Genesis. But because of that, the, the perfect Gan Eden that we had was just was ruined, right? The, so they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, tempted by the serpent. They fell for it. And now we're born in a, a sinful state where we're stained with sin, right? And unless we've come to uh, repentance, obedience, and, and now this what God did, which he absolutely said in Genesis 3.15, is he would send us the seed, which would be Messiah, would come and destroy Satan, okay? So we celebrate that. Great, okay? So now, what does this first fruits thing mean, right? It's like, well, it's first fruits. Um, he continues, but in each, each own order, Messiah, the first fruits, then it is coming, those who belong to Messiah, then the end, he will hand over the kingdom of God, the Father. He has destroyed all rule and all authority and power. Okay, so first fruits, you know, we see he's the first fruits of the resurrection. What does that mean? I mean, many people have read that, or maybe you, you haven't read it because your pastors haven't told you to read it, um, or they haven't read it, or they read it very quickly, and they make some sort of symbolic gesture about it or ignore it altogether. I don't know, but I asked the question. I said, what does it mean, first fruits? And people presented this to me before, okay? I use, I, for 12 years of my walk, I've been a believer 21 years. For 12 years, I was going to churches. You know, I left the church after like seven, but I was like, what gives? Why, why am I feeling like the church isn't really doing what God said we're supposed to do? Truth was, I wasn't reading my Bible. That's just, a, that's just a, the truth. And now that I've been immersed myself in the Bible for many years, I see things and I'm like, God, wow, how can this be? And you see, like, you have to desire God in his word, which he says is gonna is eternal. If you don't have a desire for it, then you're not going to understand the things of the spirit. You'll read the Bible. Many scholars have read it. They've determined, you know, what it means scholarly, but they don't have a holy conviction. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They have head knowledge and head knowledge can only go so far. You have to, this has to be something that's in you. So what I share with you is I think there's, there's a few different types of people that I'm going to share with. One, somebody who's innocently ignorant of the scripture because no one's ever taught them the right way. And they might be hearing things for the first time and going, I've never heard this before, right? Well, that's something that should cause you to say, if that's me, then you know what? I want to understand this, right? It should cause your heart to desire truth. And we'll talk about that. The second group of people that I think I see, um, they're knowingly or willfully ignorant, meaning maybe they've heard it, but they've just decided, you know, it's not important, but they've heard it, okay? And they won't have an excuse. I really don't believe anybody will, but this is why the God, God is raising up people in the end to teach you the truth, which is return to God, meaning repent of your sins, be immersed in Yeshua's sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. Again, if you haven't, or if you have, and then follow the Ten Commandments. Okay. So then that's that group, I think, we have to be patient and enduring with them. Okay, we have to teach them. And I'm not talking about this arrogantly, like I know this. I'm a student, just like every one of us in the body. Um, but I think it's our duty as brethren that if you have a gift of teaching, if you have a gift of exhortation, if you have the gift of shepherding, then you share this with people out of the love that God forgave you and caused you to um, be able to do this, okay? It's not fun. A brother on here would know it's not fun, right? But there is joy in serving God, and there is joy in seeing a, a, a one person repent. There is joy in it. Uh, so those people, I think there's a patience with it, right? They're sort of not ready, but it's like, hey, they're still coming back. They still want to know. 
And then there's the people who basically arrogantly transgress and they don't care. These people you need to rebuke and you need to rebuke them with authority and with the word because they are leading other people astray. Yes, Leviticus 19, 17, 18. It's loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, you might speak more boldly to them. So if you hear me speaking boldly at times, it's maybe not to you who are like, man, I've never heard this. Why do I feel bad? No, it's not for you, but it's it's God's word. And so it's going to cut. It's going to, it's going to get you wherever you're at. Um, so I, I think that's why you have to understand who your audience is. That's all I'm trying to say. Because Paul's letters, which is about, what, half of the New Testament, 13 of them, He's, he's writing to different groups, and you can see some of it's just this loving exhortation, right? It's, please, you know, he's pleading with them. And then in some places, he's like, kick them out and send them to Satan because then they might repent and come back into the camp, okay? God always wants people to come back into the camp. So I pray that if I'm speaking to you and it's, it's something that you're considering, then please don't reject it if it's true. If it's not true, let me know. I'll repent. I'm happy to do it. I do it all the time. Not as much as I used to, but at the same time, I can't think that I know so much that, that I'm telling you something that I don't, you know, that I know that, you know, it's not to get you to, be, to believe me. It's to get you to trust God. Okay. It's to get you who might be watching this at some point to trust in the creator and sustainer of the universe. Yeah. Okay. And yes, yeah, trust in the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? Don't rely on your own understanding, and then he'll level your path, right? That's just what the scriptures say. Um, so, the first fruits, what I read in 1 Corinthians 15, if you go back to Leviticus 23, I'm going to show you a quick uh, sub, su, you know, feast of, the Feast of Yah, the Feast of uh, Biblical Feasts are in Leviticus 23. Um, it's when the Lord told Moses, These are my appointed times, these are the days that I appoint to meet with my people. Um, there's seven of them. One of them is weekly. It's called the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. Um, it's on Saturday, if you will, in the Gregorian calendar. Um, the appointed feast of Adonai, this is, uh, and we just left Passover. We just finished Passover. So if you look in Leviticus 23, verse 4, and I'll read till about verse uh, 10 or 11, it says, these are the appointed feasts, the Moedim, the feasts of the Lord. So they're the Lord's feasts. Holy convocations, which are you were to proclaim in their appointed season. So they're, they're to be called out assembly. We did one yesterday at Beth Yeshua International in Macon. It was one of the most powerful, exciting, beautiful days I remember being in a congregation. There was so much love in that room. It says, during the first month on the 14th day of the month in the evening is the Lord's Passover. Okay, that's what we we're celebrating. On the 15th day of the month, the, it, the same month, is the feast of, it says matzah, which is unleavened bread, to the Lord, okay? For seven days, you're to eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you are to have a holy convocation and you shall do no regular work. Instead, you are to present an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You are to do no regular work, okay? Continuing, the Lord Adonai, Yah, spoke to Moshe, Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. So you, so people you know, already, they'll, they'll already back out and say, oh, this is for Israel, right? And I can't, I can't speak this enough because this is something that absolutely changed my walk with Yah, with Yeshua, with Jesus. That's what people call, you, you want to call him whatever, but you have to know who he is, okay? This changed my walk when I realized that I'm grafted into the olive tree, which is the covenant promises made through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of our faith, a Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, right? Jacob's name was changed to Israel. You were grafted into the covenant promises that were made to them, and they were fulfilled through the Messiah, Yeshua, okay? Fulfilled, meaning not done away with, meaning exhorted, like they were made, no they were fulfilled, like um, fully preached, fully known, they were expressed through his his holy days that that this Messiah would come and fulfill these things perfectly. The Leviticus twenty three is all about Messiah. It's all about Messiah because he's fulfilled these he's fulfilled these feasts. There will be a, a greater fulfillment, 
when we go into the kingdom and we finish at we like Yeshua, we're going to fulfill finally Passover. It'll be totally done when we get into the kingdom because he said, I won't drink from this cup until it's fully known in the kingdom. But this, these things are, are in, these should be making you go, oh no, like I, I was taught the things that really, really upset the Lord and I've been doing them for so many years and I didn't realize that this is what he wanted me to celebrate. Okay. I can bash on Christmas and Easter all day because they're not in the Bible. They're not of God. But if you if you didn't know that, just listen because you'll you'll want to have your ears opened so that you'll know what's true. And the reason I even share this with you is not to make you become a Jew or make you you know a Ju Judaize somebody or like whatever. Right? No. Don't you want to know what's true so it makes sense and you have you understand the firmness of your faith that you have the you possess the Holy Spirit that you won't be afraid when tribulation and the, tr the trials come. You'll rejoice if someone throws you into a pit, right, and kills you because you'll be fully, you know, full of the Spirit because you'll have this heart that just loves and will obey God no matter what he says. So we, there's one thing that God, I think, there's many things that God says he hates, but one of the biggest sins, and this is the one that keeps people out of the kingdom, is idolatry, which is worshiping other gods or blaspheming the name of God, meaning this Holy Spirit, by doing the things that he forbids from the beginning of the book all the way through the end. It's tough, right? But we should have burned what, what we should, instead of baptizing these pagan feasts, we should have burned them. And you might say, hey, I wasn't there. I didn't do that. This is what I was taught. Because that's what I thought too, right? I'm like, well, that's not why I celebrate it. What I realized when God, when I, he spoke to my heart, and he will speak to your heart, how do, how do you think I feel about them is what he'd say. That's a question we should be all asking Adonai, the Lord our God. What do you say? Because if he says, it's, abomin it's abominable to me, then we would give it up. At least you should. Think about it. If God is really your God, I mean, you worship him in spirit, not a false spirit, but the Holy Spirit and truth, which is his word, then we will be bent towards this and we will go, oh my goodness, like your mind will open up. But he won't do it if you remain stiff-necked, meaning rebellious about his ways. He just won't do it. He will not give you the the, full, the filling of his Holy Spirit because, because God cannot reside in a temple that's been defiled. But the mercy of God is that he sent Messiah so that to those who believed, meaning repent of their sins, trust in his sacrifice, clean their robes, obey the commandments, would then enter into life. And I know it's it's unpopular to teach this, but I want to show you a couple other things because um, when I said there was God can't reside, his spirit can't reside inside of people, um, inside the temple of God, which you are the temple, you cannot worship God and demons at the same time. There's no fellowship. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, don't, don't yoke yourself with a team of unbelievers. How can righteousness and lawlessness be partners? What fellowship does light have with darkness? This is the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, now 15. What harmony can there be between Messiah and Bilalal, right, which is ungodly men? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement can there be between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And God said, I will house myself in them and I will walk among you. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, see there's a therefore, go out from the midst and separate yourselves. Don't even touch what's unclean. Then I myself will receive you. In fact, I will be your father. You hear this? And you will be my sons and daughters. These are the fulfillment of the prophecy that he's speaking about from Leviticus 26 in Exodus 6. Okay. And he's also speaking what Jeremiah said and Ezekiel said in Isaiah, if I didn't say Isaiah already. But this is what the what the Lord of hosts says in verse in chapter 7. Now he says this, therefore, my dear friends, see that see, he's calling you a child, a dear friend, and this is what he's telling you. He's exhorting us, right? Since we have these promises, let us purify ourselves from everything that can defile either the body or the spirit and strive to be completely holy out of reverence for God. 
yes, yes, the Apostle Paul's gospel that everybody says they follow is not a cheap grace that Jude says well, is, is nothing, right? These are going to be many people that said they believed in him, but they had no fruit. They had no, they had no actions to prove it. And I think it's more about not caring about other people than it is about how holy you keep yourself, right, away from people. No, you're, you're supposed to be full of light, not hide, and go out and share in the darkness the, the light that's inside of you. So the question is, how can you share the light with people if you don't really possess it? And I really believe that that's what the first fruits of the resurrection are about. It's connected to God's holy, he's saying the holiness of God. And when I looked up first fruits, it's in the it's in the New Testament, I think, eight times within and you'll see it in Romans uh, chapter eight, and you'll see it in uh, I think it's in Romans 16, a different context. But James one has it in there in 18. It has it in Ezekiel. I'm sorry, that's in the Old Testament. Uh, Revelation 14, four, when he's speaking about the 144,000, that's a whole different teaching I don't have time for. Um, and I don't fully understand it yet, so I'm not going to teach on something I don't fully understand. Um, it's by faith. So, and then Ezekiel 48 talks about the first fruits, and it's and if you look in those words, you'll see it's a holiness. The first fruits would be what you would what you would sacrifice to God as the first fruits of your of your life, like the of your flock, uh, your children. Right, you consecrate them to be holy unto God. Um, Peter speaks about this: "Be holy, for I am holy." Right, this is the Lord God saying this about us. Um, in the book of Hebrews, he says, "With you know, pursue peace and holiness, for without you will not see the Lord." It's a pursuit of holiness, because nobody's totally holy, right? You'd say, "Hey, I'm I'm holy. I believe in Christ." Okay, um, how how are you doing with sin? Are you are you being transformed into an obedient child or uh, you know, obedient vessel for God's glory? Or are you lukewarm, meaning in two camps, serving, you know, double-minded, unstable? And, you know, again, there's going to be people out there who are like, gosh, this really cuts to my heart. Like, I don't like this. They're like, good. Like, that's that's beautiful. It's beautiful, right, to to receive a, a loving rebuke from a brother or sister who who just wants the best for you, that, that we want what's best for you. Um, it's another thing to somebody who comes against you and calls you a heretic or um, what's the other one they call us uh, who are who are telling you to repent and, and obey the commandments. Um, I already said Judaizer, right? Yeah, that's one they call you. You know, they would say the same things to Christ himself. You know, they were the Pharisees. They were the ones they were saying, oh, the Pharisees are Jews. Sure, the Pharisees were Jews, right, at that time, but they were the religious leaders. The, the Jews, the Jews, they said the Jews, right, in, the, in a lot of these uh, versions, but the, the, the believers, the first believers were all Jews. So if you're going to be a Jew, be like the disciples, those Jews, because they went out with the power of God and they shared the true light of Messiah with the world, right? First in Jerusalem, and then it went out into the diaspora through the Apostle Paul, and then his brothers, they went out, they, they, their talents were built, they, they didn't, you know, they had some divisions because you see division. But look, it started in Jerusalem and it went out. The Torah went out from, from Jerusalem, from Zion, it went forth. So that's what happened. Um, where was I? Um, all of this, okay, so all of this needs to be rooted and shared in love. And, you know, if you say, if you hear something and it, and it makes you upset, Ask yourself this question: Am I upset because I don't like what this person said, and it's true, or I don't, or I'm upset because this person is is false and they're teaching something that's untrue? That should be what your heart says. That should be what you should be asking yourself before you start telling someone they're wrong. I have brothers and sisters that approach me. I can tell if they're approaching me in love and sharing this with me to encourage me and to cause me to search it out. I won't reject it because I, I trust that they're, they're seeking God and I, and, I, and I love that. And it could be about certain topics that I don't find at the top of importance. But if I were to say the most important thing right now, especially in the world we live in, where people are like freaking out because they should be in a lot of ways because they are losing everything. 
right? But why are you worried about losing the things that, that really are, are, are going to be lost anyway? Whether it's money, a, a relationship that's ungodly you shouldn't be in, um, you know, whatever it might be, a, a job maybe you shouldn't be in, uh, a house, something that is of, of value to you, a worldly value. So worldly value is, is of zero, zero to God, okay? So why are we freaking out? Well, because we're afraid to lose our lives. Look, we're all in the same playing field here. We're all flesh and blood, but if we're possessed by, if we have the spirit of God in us, you know, that's why Yeshua said you used to fear the one that could kill your body and throw your soul into Gehenom, which is to the furnace, if you will, the hell, lake of fire. That's the one you should fear, he says. So, um, but it's all got to be rooted in love. And love, truth, the truth is love, okay? Um, Yeshua said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. That's John 14, 15. And then he says, then I'll, I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you a comforting counselor like me, the spirit of truth, which will guide you into truth. So if you've had the spirit of grace upon your heart that caused you to come to the realization of who he is, and you've repented of your sins, and you've had remorse, and you now are walking in, in, in striving in obedience, being led by the Spirit of God, you will get the second, you'll get the second helper that, that Yeshua told you about in John 14, uh, 16. Um, he speaks about it in other places too. Um, and a brother posted here, um, Acts 5.32, and I've shared this many times, um, he says, uh, we are witness to these things. This is Peter saying, and so is the Holy Spirit who is given to those who obey him. So obedience is part of our walk, guys. It is. Um, you can't really, like, you can't really say that Jesus and, and the Word of God are separate from one another. When he says, you love me, obey my commandments, the Father and I are one. Um, he wants us to, to trust him meaning to obey him because that's that's love you know the world wants to tell you that love is um emotional and, it, and it's something that's going to make you like maybe through a song feel like like emotions and, and cry but somewhere in there god's trying to prick your heart to to really call upon his name because it says those who call on the name will be on his name will be saved you know and that's a prophecy about israel um I won't, I'm not going to go down the path of explaining the Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom issue because right now I just want people to at least get back into the Word of God and start seeing that when Christ rose, it fulfilled this day called First Fruits in Leviticus 23. Okay, He was the first fruits. He will, he's the first fruits of the resurrection, right? And then we're connected to the first fruits of the resurrection in Revelation if you are part of that first fruits group, which is a holy. A holy group. I trust that that's the remnant that God is rooting and raising up right now. That you'll be part of that. And so I want to encourage you, you guys who and gals who are my brothers and sisters in the Lord, to keep pursuing a holy walk with God. It's going to separate you from your own family. In fact, uh, I was just sharing with a sister on here, uh, Matthew ten. This is the Matthew ten club. It says, "Don't." Matthew 10, 34 says, Don't suppose I've come to bring peace. This is Messiah speaking. I have not not peace that I've come to bring, but a sword. See, he's going to cut. For I've come to set, and this is where he's quoting Micah 7, a man against his father. Man, I see it all the time. A daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and that a man's enemies will be members of his own household. Um, if you start to obey the Ten Commandments, and people in your house don't understand it. It's uh, it's prophetic. Yeshua said that you're going to be rejected by your own family. Okay, um, I, my heart goes out to you. I know what it feels like to an extent, but I'm a, I'm a grown man now, so I don't have the same pressures that maybe a, a teenager or a young person living at home does. Um, you can't sustain yourself, so you have to honor your parents. But if they start to tell you you can't. You know, you don't honor your 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 parents. Like like if your parents are teaching you to worship idols, like God doesn't want you doing that. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are caught in paganism that don't even realize it. So the Catholic Church, and I'll switch gears to so the Catholic Church, which many Christians are against. They say we're part of the Reformation of of um, Martin Lucifer, whatever his name is, Martin Luther. Sorry, um, who did this Reformation? But we still 
Martin Luther still didn't go all the way, right? In fact, he became highly anti-Semitic. Um, he hated the, he, he loved the grace of God so much that he rejected the truth about prophecy about the end days of Israel. Um, he was a bad dude. I know people don't like to hear it, but, um, but they didn't do enough, you know, because if people are, are upset with Catholics or Catholicism because of idol worship, right, making statues, it's not about physical statues, you guys. But if you celebrate Christmas and Easter, then you're doing what the Catholic Church does. So don't rebuke your Catholic friends if you're doing what they do. Don't do it. Okay? And I love the birth of Messiah. I celebrate the birth of Messiah. It doesn't it's not commanded, but you know, whether it happened this time of year or during Sukkot, there's a lot of there's people have different studies on it. The study I've done, I believe, shows that he was born during Sukkot, which would be the eight day celebration. I believe he was circumcised on the eighth day of Sukkot. Um I think it's beautiful if you see that, that he was conceived and then was born in, on days that God appointed, not on pagan holy days, okay? Um, yeah, more Catholics repent than Protestants. Like Catholicism has more rules that seem like they're like it's the great uh, counterfeit, if you will. It, there's people who follow Catholicism thinking that it's the true, uh, the true faith, and they've, they've tricked so many people to believe that when... Messiah told Peter, Kepha, a Jew from the Galilee, a fisherman, that on on your revelation, on this body, I will build on your name, I'll build this church. And he became the first pope. He wasn't a pope. He was a Jewish man from the Galilee, a very powerful one because he totally was was done. He was a man of great faith, one of my favorite apostles, because he just went for it. He was bold. And yeah, he denied the Messiah, but man, he was restored. He was restored, and God used him for my trying to call me on here. I thought I blocked that out. Anyway, uh, so what they're doing, a lot of these people, is they're yelling at the Catholics saying, you're full of demons and you're, you're Luciferian, and you guys uh, are Illuminati-based, and you and the, the, the uh, Zionistic Jews are all together Luciferians. And I'm like, hold up, man, time out. You're doing what they do. You worship on Sunday. You worship on uh, Easter and in, in in Christmas, and and you're yelling at them. You know it's better just to be quiet on that thing. But listen, the Asherah pole and Baal, these things, these things, Asherah bull and Molech are still idols, and people think they're worshiping the Christ and they're not. And you're saying, how can you say that, Mick? How can you say that? I'm glad you asked. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it says this about these men, right? In, in verse 13, of, it says, The fact is that such men are pseudo-emissaries. See, they look like apostles, but they're not. And they tell lies about their work, and they masquerade as emissaries of the Messiah. Masquerade. There's nothing, it says, there's nothing, nothing surprising in that the adversary, Satan himself, masquerades as an angel of light. So there's no great thing. If his workers masquerade as servants of righteousness, they will meet their end, their deeds deserve. So if anything you've listened to, just hit the time out right now and say, it's time to pray. It's time to call out to God, okay? The, the thing is, if you feel like there's something off, like there's something wrong, like the church, I don't, I don't feel like it's right, but like I need God and you're going to church, test what they're saying if, and read your Bible, right? If they're telling you that, if they're telling you about about Messiah, but they're not telling you to obey what he told you to obey, or the first disciples told you to obey, follow the covenant, follow the Ten Commandments, and you'll walk in truth, and, and the Spirit will increase in you, and then you will bear fruit for his kingdom. They're not going to tell you that. They're not going to tell you to repent. They're not going to tell you to live holy. They're going to tell you messages that make you feel good. And you're in the problem is it's so watered down and it's so like mind numbing that we've we've sort of embraced it as a culture. And so when we celebrate, people are not even they're not even being transformed. They're being lukewarm and they're still partying and doing the stupid stuff that they used to do when he says righteousness and lawlessness have nothing to do with each other. And you're like, self-righteous people. Self-righteous people? 
I've seen so many of them. And yeah, don't worry about other people. Worry about what God's saying to you right now. Worry about what God's saying to you right now because it should cause fear and, and trembling when you stand in the presence of God. You should be changing your clothes, meaning like, I need to get this filth out of me. But if you do that, you have to do that before you can approach God. But it should be with fear and trembling. I said to people the other day, it's actually Satan's not as scary as God. That's why so many people choose him. Fearing God and keeping his commandments is the purpose of being a, a human being. That's what it says. If you think that Jesus came to free you from the perfect instructions of God, rather than writing them in your heart and causing you with his spirit to, to walk in this righteousness that, that you didn't, you didn't do for your you didn't do on your own it's it's just a totally different message that you're going to get in the church today they're going to twist the words of paul to the destruction of so many people and that's why i'm so passionate about this it it like oh if i if i was like like some of these people who are so selfish that all they care about is watching their football games and, and tv instead of reading this and immersing in it and feeling god's conviction over my life and needing to change and then what would be the purpose of that if I just sat in my house and did nothing to help anybody else? How selfish of a, a, a human being would I be? How horrible, how horrifically selfish would I be? I don't want you to follow my account. I don't want you to follow anything. I want you to pray, read your Bible, ask God and say, please speak to me. Please tell me if what's true and what's right. I don't know. I'm afraid. Be honest. A lot of people are walking around in, in self-pride or pride and, and a lack of true humility or it's the false humility. You don't need to see another circus show. You don't need to go to another church where they play you a rock concert and some guy comes out with balloons and does an analogy of how your faith can increase. And, and you know, if you fill it with God's spirit, it'll, it'll float and you'll be above the clouds. You know how I want to puke when I see that? They're not teaching you. They're It's their own imaginations and they're teaching you to obey Satan. That's what they're teaching you. Prophecy is being fulfilled, everybody. Prophecy is being fulfilled right now, right? And you are part of it. You're either fulfilling it for, for God's uh, workmanship and his righteousness, or you're fulfilling it for, for Satan. And and look, if, if I didn't use scripture, you'd call me a, a liar. But Matthew 7, 23, 21 through 23, Yeshua says this directly out of his mouth. So read it and then look at the words and ask God, pray. He says, there'll be many on that day who'll say, Lord, 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 didn't we prophesy in your name? He'll say, the kingdom is only for people that do what my father wants. And then he says, I didn't know you. You were an iniquity, lawlessness. In, in Hebrew, it's avon, it's twisted. It's It's twisting. And Peter warned us in 2 Peter 3.15, he says they're going to twist Paul's words to your own destruction. And what's that? It's the lawless, the wicked. God is going to save the remnant of righteous, the first fruits. He's gonna, they're going to resurrect and they're going to be with him forever. That's when the fullness of the new covenant comes into play. But to those who are wicked and they didn't even know it, they're going to say, what happened? Like, I trusted in you. I did these works in your name. And he said, you disobeyed my commandments. It's so important, you guys. It's so important. Um, and, and you know, worldliness is, is really, really, really thick in the church. Um, 1 John 2 says, you know, don't love the things of the world. If you love the things of the world, love of the Father is not in you. Yeshua said, if the world hates you, that then it's a good thing. You know, you're going to be hated. But you will be able to endure through the hate and the pain and the suffering, whether it's physical or emotional or any other way, because God's Spirit will be in you. He'll comfort you. That's what the comforting counselor is for. It's not to make you comfortable in your sin and your idolatry. It's to make you comfortable in your persecution for following his ways and serving him in righteousness. That's the power of God. That's why Stephen can be stoned. If Stephen could be stoned and say, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing, that's got to be something that we'd be able to do. And why do we question whether we'd be able to do that? Because we're not dead enough to ourselves. We're not seeking his holiness and his righteousness in a way that's going to cause us to have a walk with him that is absolutely set apart. Okay?
Um, so, uh, the last thing I'll say about the, this, this topic is that the prophecy of Isaiah, what Yeshua said about uh, people in this world that would claim to be the religious leaders, the, the religious people, what they would do, what they would do is they would honor God's or honor man's traditions above the commandments of God. That's what the that's what these pagan holy days are about. I speak about them like this because you have to know what's true. The truth can save you. If you look at Second Thessalonians two, people are rejecting the truth, which is God's word, which could save them. Yeshua in John seventeen, when he prayed to the Father for you and me, he said, "Set them apart for holiness by the means of your truth, for your word is truth." If you're not in his word, and his word is not in you, you will not have the spirit. You will not be able to endure it all the way till the end. You will not. And Yeshua said the, the end days in Matthew 24, he said lawlessness, right? People's love will wax cold, meaning it'll be psycho. The word, the word there is psycho. And you think that, you know, the word psycho means crazy. The love will wax cold. Why? Because of iniquity, lawlessness. They've rejected, we've rejected the commandments of God for our own traditions, for our own sake. And then what we do is we say, God, we're going to worship you the way we want to worship you. And you're going to bless us, God, because you're a blesser. You're going to make us wealthy. God, is, if, you're, if you're poor and needy and you've been poor and needy and you've cried out to God, then you know what I'm saying is true. Because that's when you've experienced the grace, the true grace of God. It's not when you're when you're wealthy and doing really well that you're desperate and you actually experience God's power. It's when you've it's when you've lost something very valuable to you that God took away from you because He's good and He's merciful. And that doesn't mean we lack compassion like Job's three friends, right? We don't tell him, Hey, you must have sinned. No, we don't know if someone sinned. But it is the mercy of God. He's being merciful to us. Yeah, there's 50,000 denominations. I prayed, I asked God which one was right years ago, and he said none of them. So you can believe me or not um, that I heard that, but that's what I'm telling you I heard. But Yeshua said in, in, in Mark 7, verses 6 uh, through 8, I marked this because it's, I didn't mark it, did I? But I'll read it. Okay, Mark 7, verse 6. And this is when the, the this is when, thank you, brother. That's This is when the, the Pharisees, the, the Purishim, and the Torah teachers um, asked him. They said, why does your disciples live in accordance to, do not live in accordance with the traditions of the elders? So park that for a second because someone might say, Paul said, obey the, the traditions of the elders. Because listen, the traditions of the elders and those those ecclesia, those churches, those those synagogues, they were obeying the commandments and they had traditions that were aligned with the commandments of God. Here's what he says: Instead, they eat with ritually unclean hands. Yeshua answered them, "This is a rebuke to the church." Yes, Yahu Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. He's now reading Isaiah twenty nine thirteen. These people honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. Their worship from me is useless because they teach man-made rules as if they were doctrines. And he says in verse 8, You depart from God's command and hold on to human tradition. And said, Indeed, he said to them, Indeed, indeed, you have made a fine art of departing from God's command in order to keep your tradition! Exclamation point. Right? And he goes on. But if what I'm saying is, is true, then you, then you should listen and, and, and try to figure out for yourself if what God says, what, if Yeshua is God in the flesh, he's speaking on behalf of, of the word of God right there. He's saying what Isaiah said was right. Okay? He's saying what Isaiah said was right. So you, you don't, if you don't read the Bible, the whole thing, you're not going to understand what Jesus was talking about there, Yeshua. You aren't going to understand what he's saying. And you'll think, oh, they're talking about the Jews. No, he was rebuking the, the religious leaders who honored their traditions above the commandments of God. Above the commandments of God. So why don't I celebrate Easter and, and Christmas like the church does? Because that's what I would be. I would be in that category. 
I don't want to be in that category. I really don't think you want to be in that category either. Believe me, I don't think you do. I was in this category. So I'm not sharing this with you out of pride or arrogance because I serve, I keep God like that. I serve, I serve God. No, I'm saying if you never heard it before, then praise God. If you're listening for the first time and you go, this is making sense to me, then praise the Lord. Praise hallelujah, which is praising his name. People don't even know his name anymore. Jeremiah 23, he said that people will forget my name for Baal, okay? And Baal means Lord, but if you think about it, the name Jesus was was is, is uh, Jesus, right? It's Baal, like people are calling on his name thinking they're saying his name. Yeshua, or Yahushua, Yahushua, Yahshua, it means Yah salvation. That's why I say it. I'm not rebuking you for using the name. What I'm saying is, listen, there's truth right now that's coming out. And it's at a time where the world is shaking, okay? The world is shaking. And you don't want to shake with it. You want to live in this unshakable kingdom, the Hebrews 12, unshakable kingdom, because that's the kingdom that's going to save you. That's the one you're going to serve him in. And if you think there's no rules, right, we're practice, what you should be doing now is practicing for life with Messiah. Because when you're with Messiah, we will be living in perfect holiness. Like, that's... That's when we finally get to eat from the tree of life. Thank God that he protected us from Adam and Eve from eating from the tree of life after they sinned. Because those who will, will wash their robes, it says in, in Revelation twenty two fourteen, who keep, do the commandments will have the right to eat from the tree of life and enter into the city gates, the new Jerusalem. So we focus our minds on the things of God. We focus our mind like Messiah to do the will of the Father. He said those who do the will of the Father will have the right to enter into the kingdom. And he says the prayer of the faithful, the prayer of the, he says, how do we pray? Yeshua told us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, your name is holy. Your kingdom come. See, the first thing we pray after we acknowledge the holiness of the Father, his name, is that his kingdom will come. And what people say is, I, when I die, I want to go to heaven. Heaven's coming here. It's coming here. That's why we're praying. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Read, if you read Revelation, you'll see there's going to be this thousand year period where we're going to learn for a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. I don't know if it'll be a day, but he's going to release the adversary after that. I was like, why would he release the adversary? Because he's going to find out who really believes him, who really listened and, and, and did what he said. Look, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, like he got nailed to a tree. He didn't have to do that. He did it. That's the love of God, man. Like to trust in that sacrifice, he paid the debt that you owed and you still owe if you haven't actually been immersed in his sacrifice and repented and trusted in him. You still owe that debt. All I'm saying is everyone's going to die with sin probably that they've not repented of. They're going to fall short of that grace, right? All fall short. But the blood the blood makes up the difference. How much do you want to suffer? That's the question I have. How much do you want to suffer for the sake of, of, of your own works, your own righteousness, or your wickedness? God wants us to repent, follow his holy covenant. That's exactly what the, the end days prophecies say about what's going to happen. And those people who, again, immerse themselves in the sacrifice, trust in him follow what he says, are going to have the spirit inside of them. They're going to bear fruit for the kingdom and they will be with him forever. That's what I want for myself, right? But I want that for all my brothers and sisters all around the world who may actually hear this for the first time or maybe, you've heard, maybe you're just hearing it again. I trust that it's by faith that I'm sharing this with you that God is going to do this great work in you and continue to do it until the day of Messiah, until the end comes. So, I'm sharing this with you out of my love, my heart. If you if you ever have questions, feel free to DM me. Um, I can't get to all of them. I don't know everything. Um, I will either point you to people that might um, in studies because there's brothers who have knowledge I don't have. We we get a measure of the spirit. We share our, our talents to the, the greatest ability. We glean from others. Um, or I'll point you to scripture that I think is what it says. But if you have something to share with me and you, I believe that you're a... a, a you know, your motivations are, are, um, are right. And I, I love that, you know, we're supposed to be sharpening each other, right? We're supposed to be sharpening each other. 
But it's the grace of God that's going to get us through this, guys. It is. And don't make grace into some what the preachers make it into. The grace of God is so powerful. The grace of God is the initiator of our faith. It's the, what helps sanctify us through our faith, and it's what's going to glorify us. His grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. In your weakness, praise his name. In your trials, praise his name. If you're having trouble right now and you're scared, just say, thank you, Father. It will change your faith. It will change your walk. It will change everything. If in your absolute worst times, your sickness, whatever it is, you say, thank you, God. I've done it. I'm not going to tell you something I haven't done. I've done it, and I felt peace. I felt like this makes sense, God. I absolutely couldn't believe it in the most horrific circumstance. And maybe they're not as bad as other people, but everybody's going to have their own circumstance that's horrific. Mine might not. Mine might have been worse than yours or still is at times. Um, or, or maybe yours is worse than mine. Let's have more of that compassion um, and, and love for people so that, so that they'll actually feel like, wow, this person actually cares about me. There's a big difference. Anyway, God bless you all. I'm done speaking, um, but I hope that, that this somehow um, blessed you in, in a way, in a real way, um, that God's becoming more real to you, that his spirit is increasing in you, and that, and that you have shalom, you have peace, the true peace of God. So um, you know, again, God bless you all, and have a wonderful evening. Have a great week ahead. Uh, there's more that's going to be coming. I don't want people to be afraid of what's going to happen, but the truth is, you know, we're being punished. We're being punished for, for the iniquity. Um, and that's not a popular message today. In fact, the preachers won't teach you that. Um, I'm just telling you because that's what I see in the Bible. Um, obey God. He'll give you peace. He'll give you the ability to endure through all this garbage that's happening. So I pray this over you in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, Son of God, Yeshua of Nazareth. Amen. God bless you all.